All right, this time I want to talk about a specific manufacturer, as the title says, and if you folks are interested, I'll make more videos like this. So this one's about Windless Steel Crafts, which, if you don't know, is a company founded in India in 1943 in order to make kukri knives for the Nepalese Gurkha soldiers in the British Army. This company also owns Museum Replicas Limited, which is the main supplier in North America, but they also ship worldwide. And um, so Windless is one of the biggest names on the historical reproductions market. They are considered budget range, which you can tell by the prices. But even though the blades are budget priced, they are hand forged of high carbon steel. They use either 1065, 1075, 1085 or 1095 steel. If you're not familiar with those designations, they tell you the carbon content. So 1065. Uh, steel has 0.65% carbon and 1095 has 0.95%. And the higher the carbon content, the harder the blade is, the more durable, but also the less tough. So more prone to breaking rather than bending. Generally, 1095 is a bit hard for longer blades, but uh, yeah, let's not get too much into detail there. So they take an ingot of that steel, heat it up and hammer it into its rough shape. And then a grinder takes care of the finer details of the shape and polishes it. And then it's being tempered afterwards. Their historical weapons are advertised as battle ready, which means that they are functional. They are not just decorative wall hangers. They can be used. However, I, there's one certain annoyance that I have with this. Namely, on the website it says that our swords can do everything their historical counterparts could. You mean except cut, because they are made with a one millimeter thick blunt edge, quote unquote. And that bothers me a little bit. Now, if, if, if you've been subscribed to my channel for a while, you probably already know that this is a pet peeve of mine. You know, the sharpness of swords and knives, etc. on the market. And um, this is particularly annoying. Like, don't call something battle ready if it's completely blunt. It's, it's not fully functional in that sense. Now, if you want to make, you know, practice tools, you know, for practicing historical European martial arts or doing whatever, SCA and, and etc., all of that reenactment and whatnot, then that's one thing. But then, you know, make them properly for that purpose. In the sense of, in that case, the blade needs to be more flexible, it, the point needs to be rounded off and this and that, you know, ideally minimize the mass and the blade, or at least for you know, full contact sparring, that sort of thing. It's a different application. If you have something like this that's designed for collectors who may or may not want to use the sword as well, if it's called battle ready, then I expect it to function the way a sword does and that it includes being sharp. The problem with this is that they're not just dull. One millimeter it's, it means that you have to remove quite a bit of material. And if you're not familiar with sharpening and all of that, then this is not very easy, actually. Now, I, I made a video about a way to sharpen the swords more easily recently. It's, it'll be linked down below in the video description. So that can definitely help you out. Or if you have a belt grinder, stuff like that. If you were to try to just use a stone, to sharpen this, yeah, you, you better bring a lot of patience because it's going to take quite a while. Now, a lot of the like, uh, museum replicas actually offers a sharpening service. Uh, Cult of Athena does, so you can get them sharpened, but it's just, it's something that irks me a little bit personally. Uh, one other thing on the website is, um, it says, swords were never intended to be used edge to edge against anything. Can you imagine a warrior purposefully damaging his only offensive weapon in battle, essentially disarming himself? Well, quite frankly, yes, I can. If if the choice is between losing an arm and messing up my edge, I will mess the heck out of my edge. <laughs> so <clears throat> there are situations in historical swordsmanship where you just cannot avoid edge damage. That's just how it is. And there are plenty of techniques that are in fact done, I mean, not edge on edge perpendicular, but at an angle, because there are certain mechanical 
you know, biomechanical advantages to that. For example, the way that your wrist is much more, you know, much stronger in this direction rather than that, because you have a greater range of motion here, right? And the muscles don't resist quite as well. So if you try to always parry with the flat, this can be overpowered a lot more easily. But you know, that just really as a side note. So what do I generally think of their products? Well, it depends a lot. It can be a little bit hit or miss. I've had a number of swords and other items made by Windless over the years. I don't have anything uh, or everything anymore that I used to own at some point. But uh, this is one of the better ones. So this Shamshir here, I've reviewed that. Again, link will be down below. And this is really quite good for a budget sword. There was a bit of a flaw in the fit here because there was just a little too much space. You know, this piece here that um, extends down, there was a li little too much of a gap between this and the, the wood. And also the guard wasn't as tightly on there as it could be. So as vibration travels through, this starts to loosen up and then this you know, keeps working against the wood, which it may split it apart. And in fact, there is a bit of a crack in there. So this is a weakness that you know, could be improved. But again, for the price range, this is a very, like the blade is really damn good. This is definitely high quality steel. Can't say anything about the edge because it didn't come with one. But well, it did actually call the inner sharpening service, but I had to touch it up and you know, now it's actually pretty good. It cuts really nicely. Um, I'm not a fan of this, this finish. There seems to be some kind of resin or something, some clear coat on the guard, which gives it this glossy appearance, which I'm really not a fan of. I mean, yes, it prevents rust, so that's good, but it, it doesn't look too good. Now, I shouldn't go into too much detail because otherwise this will be like a redundant double review of the same thing that I've already done. But, you know, just as a few pointers. So they generally come with a sheath or scabbard, which is good. Um, another side note, if you don't know, a sheath is generally what's called a, uh, a soft um, receptacle <laughs> for the sword, if you will. So the sheath doesn't have a hard wooden core, whereas a scabbard usually does. So that one I would consider a hit. This, on the other hand, is more of a miss, unfortunately. This is a, a short Zulu spear, and uh, it looks very nice. Um, the way it's shaped and all, it's, you know, it's, it also seems to be solidly assembled. You can see right there where a pin was driven through the socket of the spear and then polished. It's got this uh, brass wire here, which you know, also helps hold it in place, which also really looks quite nice. Uh, the wood, I don't know what it is. Can't say I'm not, not an expert on wood. The blade, well, it looks fine, but we've got a bit of a problem here because uh, the first time I used this, you know, with how long the spear point is, this is suitable for cutting. I tried that and it bent on the very first cut. So this means that this steel here is too soft for the purpose. It may also have to do with the shape here because this is fairly abrupt. If you look at the transition from the socket to the blade. So this is a relatively steep angle here. If this was smoother, more gradual, this might be stronger or if, if the base was thicker, if there was more of a taper. But as it is, you have from the socket to the blade changes rapidly, and then you have the same blade thickness throughout. So it could be fixed either by changing the shape or by using harder steel. But um, yeah, this one is really a shame because this it could be extremely nice. This one here I've reviewed and I don't have any problems with. Now the head is crooked on there because I abused the crap out of this one. I was you know, repeatedly smashing it into a, a dead tree trunk because I was at that point I was getting pretty confident in uh, the you know toughness of this mace. And uh, so really the only thing that happened was 
I must have hit it right here. Since this is a hollow tube, it's easier to, to collapse it that way. And it's soon, as soon as it collapses there, then there is more of a, a chance of bending to occur. But that's really the only, the only thing. Nothing has fallen off or nothing has broken or anything. So the flanges are very solidly welded to it. And yeah, it's, it's all good. I haven't handled any historical originals, so I cannot say exactly how close it is in, in overall shape. It seems good. Um, handling is good. It's not too heavy. And uh, that's generally the rule of thumb. The weapons they make handle overall pretty decently. Now I say overall because there are exceptions. Back in 2008-ish, I reviewed one that was the exact opposite. It was extremely heavy and unwieldy and poorly balanced and it was just not fun to use in any way, shape or form. There's also the Cobra Steel line, which is more of a, a tactical appearance. I've shown this before in other videos and uh, this is one that I generally like to recommend for people who are on a limited budget because these are very affordable, but they have the same you know, good quality steel and uh, you know, there's not much that can go wrong here. There's a rubber over mold over the tang and uh, yeah, this is sturdy. It works, you know, it's just nothing wrong with it. Cheap sheaths, but you know, they have to cut corners somewhere, right? And there's no pun intended in that. So, yeah, it, again, as I said, it depends a little bit on what it is in particular. One of the common problems that I've seen people mention over the years, well, a couple of years back, was that especially their longer and narrower blades tend to be overly flexible. Now, I don't know if that's been changed. It might be because as I said that, is, that was a couple of years ago. But overall, I'd say it's pretty decent, especially in the budget range. You know, you, you basically have products, at least what I've tried so far, ranges from bad in some cases to you know, pretty decent to really quite exceptionally good for the price. So, of course, it's not going to be comparable to an $800 or $1,000, you know, either production or custom sword, but for what you get or for what you pay, it's really good. So generally, I don't have a problem with windless products. They are usually worth trying out, you know, especially if there's something that you're just curious about and you're thinking, okay, do I, do I really want to invest a whole lot of money into it? And this may be a good option. They're not always entirely historically accurate, but generally that's pretty decent. So if you want to browse some windless products, I'll leave a link in the video description. It's at Call of Athena, which I generally recommend because of the good prices and international shipping. And I've just had really positive experiences with them. So there you go. Hope you found it interesting and thanks for watching.